Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace. In this episode, we're gonna talk about science in space. We've got a special guest here. We're gonna learn all sorts of interesting things about uh, rodents in space, about why we need microgravity and what its benefit is. We're also gonna talk about a space-based US National Laboratory that maybe you didn't even know was there. It's gonna be really cool. So let's kick into it. So here today I have Dr. Mike Roberts of CASIS. He's the Deputy Chief Scientist of the Center for Advancement of Science in Space. Is that correct? That's close enough. Okay, good. Um, so tell us a little bit about what CASIS is. So CASIS is a, a not-for-profit organization that works in partnership with NASA to manage the International Space Station National Lab. So our job uh, in managing the International Space Station National Lab is providing pathways for science and technology development in space. Cool. So when it comes to calling it a national lab, what does that what does that mean? What does national lab even mean? So we have the great honor and distinction of being the only national lab that operates off planet. We operate in low Earth orbit. Uh, we are the only national lab that is operating at 17,500 miles per hour Whoa. up there. Yeah. So we feel like we're unique. <laughs> it seems like. Uh, and as a national lab, our mission is to serve the nation, uh, to provide opportunities and, and unique access to environments that aren't possible anywhere else. And that's pretty easy to do in the space environment. We have access to microgravity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We've got access to points outside the station where folks who are interested in looking at the way things behave and the harshness of space can put them out there and leave them for as long as they need to. And we also have, uh, as an advantage of the International Space Station operating in that low Earth orbit, it's a satellite, right? So it has the, the capability of looking back at Earth and taking images of anywhere that it travels. And we're fortunate in that with the orbital inclination at which the International Space Station travels, we cover over 90% 90, 90 of the populated areas of Earth. So what have we learned from the International Space Station National Lab that um, you know, we couldn't have learned here, like give me an example of something we've learned maybe recently that we couldn't have learned here on the ground. Yeah. Well, let me go back a little bit historically. Sure. One of the most fascinating aspects of the International Space Station, even that predates the International Space Station National Lab, is that humans have been living and operating in the space environment for over 18 years now. So we've had a constant presence in space for nearly 20 years. Um, and, and that's important because that enables us to understand what it's like to live off planet, which is uh, one possibility in our future we don't want to think about, but always having a backup plan is, is a good idea going there. And what we've learned in addressing those issues of how to maintain humans in that environment have led to discoveries in the medical realm, to discoveries in the, the use of new materials, operation of uh, life support systems that are absolutely required in the space environment, but actually have advantages down here on Earth. NASA continues to fund research and exploration, and, and most of that research is focused on learning about our solar system and beyond, and learning about how we can maintain a human presence not only close to Earth, but actually around the moon, on the surface of the moon, Mars one day, and maybe even beyond. The ISS National Lab is focused on research and technology development that translates to direct benefit here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So we use the same research environment, but we approach it with different questions in mind. So from our perspective at the International Space Station National Lab, we've seen a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies. Hmm. Uh, one of the neat things you, you may have seen in astronaut videos is their ability to actually fly mm -hmm. in that environment. And that translates into them not having mechanical loading on their bones and muscles. So the astronauts have a, a prescribed exercise regime they go through every day. They have drugs that they take in order to maintain uh, bone density and maintain muscle strength. But we can send mice or other test organisms up there that don't have the benefit of those drugs and those exercise devices. And we can then track the loss of bone mineral density over time. Uh, that's important because here on Earth, as we age, our, our bones and muscles weaken. Drug companies have developed some pretty effective uh, treatments for osteoporosis and other things that affect us as we get older, but they're always looking for better drugs that have mm -hmm. fewer side effects. We've seen a lot of interest in material science as well. I mentioned that there are platforms outside in the environment of space that enable folks to test new materials that are going to be used in spacecraft and small satellites. The International Space Station itself is 
in addition to being a remote sensing platform for looking at Earth, it also has a, a very large sensor array called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is looking back into deep space to understand wow. the, the origin of, of dark matter and dark energy. So it's essentially a, a multifunctional platform out there that you know you bring your imagination to the, to the forefront and decide how you want to play there. Uh, and with the creation of the National Lab, we now have the opportunity to work with federal agencies in addition to NASA. So we have research projects currently operating on orbit that were sponsored by the National Science Foundation, asking very fundamental basic questions about fluid flow and physics and combustion in that environment. We have experiments that are sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, who are looking at building small miniaturized organ systems on, on disposable chips. Whoa. And they can use those chips to address questions about how effective a drug is going to work on you individually. So it feeds into the personalized medicine research that's going on now. And we have research that's sponsored by different elements of the Department of Defense. They're using the space environment to look at wound healing mm. and ways to uh, accelerate the pace of wound healing for soldiers in the field and for anyone who, who uh, endures a broken bone or a, a skin, skin rupture here on Earth. Wow. So you guys aren't busy at all is what you're saying, it sounds like. Sometimes we're busier <laughs> than others, but no, it's good. There's a, there's a lot going on. During a, a typical, we talk about increments in the International Space Station. So crew members, is a, uh, I hope everybody's aware, we currently have six crew members up on orbit. Sometimes we have as many as seven uh, who are working up in that environment. And they work in rotations of about six months at a time, and each six-month increment has on the average of 350 experiments that crew members are operating. So they're very busy uh, with daily routines, not only maintaining the International Space Station, but actually conducting science and doing technology development. And we're learning a lot about living in space, but the real learning that we're getting there is how space affects our bodies mm -hmm. and how important the environment is in maintaining our health and other things. So mm -hmm. although the International Space Station wasn't built, I think, with that in mind. It's become a very important aspect of what it's now capable of doing and what we're doing on National Lab. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think, too, to touch back on one more thing um, about having animals up there. I guess, what's the, the thought process of sending rodents and, and other kind of animals into space, other than potentially like bone loss, as you mentioned? Right, right. so the, the most common animal up there in, in terms of, of um, infrastructure that we use to support are the humans, of course. Sure. So the humans, uh, one of the, the paybacks for being able to be an astronaut or a cosmonaut is that you sign up to be a test subject. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the research focus that's focused on understanding effects on the human body in that environment. And those, in addition to the microgravity effects and the elevated radiation, you also learn a lot about crew interactions and social interactions because you're working with uh, uh, in a confined space environment, which is very unnatural. Um, it's a very large space station, but you're still gonna see the same people day after day. We use different animal models to address different questions in that environment. In some cases, we use animal models because they're smaller and they reproduce more quickly. Mm -hmm. So you can look at multi-generations of exposure to that space environment, and we haven't done any experiments with humans reproducing in space. so. We get valuable information from that. The reason we use mice and rats in that environment is they're mammals like us. They reproduce quickly. They have a they share a lot of the same genetic content that we do. They're obviously very different, and we haven't shared a common ancestor in a few hundred million years. The mice themselves are, are uh, actually very good study cases because they adapt very quickly to mm -hmm. the microgravity environment. Um, they don't have spacesuits. Uh, and they live in a very different environment in, in the space than they do here on Earth, but they learn how to, to navigate around their cage by using their front paws instead of, their, instead of just free floating hmm. around the environment. So one of the questions we get all the time is, are the mice simply free floating around and bumping into each other? And what they typically do is they crawl around the cage much like the astronauts do when they're on an EVA outside the space station. They use handholds hmm. to move themselves around. The mice do the same thing inside the cages. Um, 
The mice don't typically launch with a, a running wheel. Uh, for those of you who have hamsters or mice at home, you typically have a running wheel so they can get their exercise. In space, sometimes the mice use their cage as a running wheel. So they will just run circles around the cage to have a good time and, and blow off some steam mm -hmm. uh, while they're up there. We use other animals as well. Fruit flies are very small, breed very fast. You can put them in little glass vials with cotton in the end of them and they do just fine. Uh, for long periods of time so and it turns out that the heart muscle inside uh, of uh, fruit flies is a very good model system for human heart one of the things we know that uh, is an effect of microgravity exposure is deconditioning of the heart your muscle actually starts to weaken your heart muscle will hmm. weaken over time because it doesn't have to push as hard against gravity to distribute the blood and the same thing will happen with uh, the cardiac muscle inside of fruit flies hmm. we've also flown fish how does uh, that work? <laughs> uh, they go up in their own little fish tanks. Um, so the, the Japanese module, uh, Kibo, had a, an aquatic facility on board, uh, which provided light and oxygen to the system for the fish to go. They flew a couple of different species of fish. Most of that work focused, again, on bone growth, looking mm -hmm. at. They used a type of fish which is almost transparent. So just by having the fish living inside the tank and then taking images of them through the side of the tank, you can see how the young fish grow into old fish and how the absence of gravity in that environment affected their bone, their bone mineral density growth. We've also flown worms, uh, different kinds of worms uh, ranging from round ones to flat ones. The flat ones are especially interesting because some of them have the ability to regenerate. Uh, for those of you who are in high school or even in uh, younger, you may have done an experiment where you took a flatworm and cut it in half with a razor blade and observed it over time for its ability to regenerate. It can grow a new head or grow a new tail. And salamanders and, and some lizards have that ability. Uh, these flatworms have that ability. Humans don't. If we lose a finger or a hand or a leg, we haven't figured out how to grow it back yet. So we're using studies of those model organisms to understand tissue repair. Yeah. Um, even for things that are far less severe, like a simple cut, they're affected by that microgravity environment. It tends to slow down the body's healing process. So scientists and, and uh, physicians are interested in understanding how that process occurs at the molecular level and ways that we can perhaps accelerate the pace of healing or regenerating those tissues uh, here hmm. on Earth by learning what they can in the space environment. That's super neat. Special thanks to Domain.com for sponsoring this episode of Seeker. Domain.com is awesome, affordable, reliable, and has all the tools you need to build a new website. They can fulfill all of your website needs. They offer .com and .net domain names and intuitive website builders. They have over 300 domain extensions to fit your needs, from .club to .space to .ninja and .pizza. Take that first step in creating an identity online and visit Domain.com. Well, I think we're going to talk a little bit more next week about uh, what technologies we've seen come out of some of these experiments and actually some more specific experiments. So make sure you guys come back next week. Until then, make sure you subscribe. And thanks for watching Seeker Plus.